Hello, my family communication scholars. Welcome to our chapter two lecture. And in here, chapter two is a pretty hefty chapter. Um, it throws a lot at you for sure. And so that's why, um, as you can see in our schedule, we are definitely spending a lot more time on chapter two than we have on chapter one or that we will on chapter three. Because I understand that this chapter throws a lot of new ideas, a lot of different ways of thinking at you, but they are so important for us to understand before we move on to chapter three um, and the subsequent chapters that enable us to understand about family communication and theories. And so really the keys to get out of this chapter are threefold. So one of the first things we need to do first is understand what theory is. So why is it useful for us? What is it and how do we use it? And then we'll move on and talk about different um, perspectives on theory, perspectives on human communication, perspectives on the human condition and how that influences a researcher. And then we'll end up with talking with some key theories in family communication that are not only great examples of the perspectives, but great examples of theories at work, um, actual theories that researchers use to try to understand family um, communication. So let's go ahead and jump on in. So the first thing um, you might notice is uh, it defines for you um, at the get-go in this chapter what theory is. And I know that the term theory, um, because it's thrown around a lot in um, a wide variety of fields in education, um, we kind of lose connection with this word a little bit, right? Um, but all a theory really is is that it's this abstract system of concepts um, that really indicates relationships, right? It tells me how two or three or four things are related to one another or influence one another or connect to one another. Um, as you might have noticed in some of our activities, I like to break down understanding theory as a why, when, or how. So when we want to ask ourselves a question of why does this happen or when does that happen or how do these two things connect, what we're really looking for is a theory, something to help us explain and understand why that happens or when something happens or how something happens. And so as you can see here, I put up on this slide the key aspects of a theory. So in every theory, you're going to get four major things. You're going to get a statement about the context, meaning that you're going to get some sort of explanation of what the theory is referring to. So of course, all the theories that we will be talking about in this class will refer to the context of family, right, and family communication. And so any theory that we cover here will make a reference to um, parents or children or family or developmental stages to help us understand understand the context in which this theory operates. The second thing that um, a theory will always have um, is a set of propositions, and propositions just simply refers to a statement trying to explain why, when, or how a behavior happens. Um, and then it'll have a statement that connects the propositions to show us what is the relationship between these two aspects, these two factors, how do these behaviors influence one another. Um, and lastly, a theory will always be tested or applied, meaning that once we come up with a theory for why or when or how something happens, we have to test it and see if our theory is right. Um, and uh, we can also apply our theories. So once we test our theories a lot and we see that, hey, it looks like our theory is somewhat accurate, we're able to apply it to use, uh, to understand family communication dynamics even more. So. Um, let me go on further um, on what a theory does. And from if you're like me, I really like learning by example. And so the definitions are definitely helpful and all the, the wonderful introductions of the three different types of families that you get in our first chapter are fantastic ways of introducing you to theory. But for me, um, the awesome part about theory, the juicy parts about theory are really what a theory does for us. Why is it useful for us? Um, and like I said, earlier, a goal of a theory is to help us explain, understand, or predict um, change, um, social change in human beings. Um, and so, of course, if any of you have taken um, any STEM classes, so you've taken a biology class, a chemistry class, anything in the sciences, you have most likely studied the scientific um, process where, of course, you have to come up with a hypothesis, right? Um, you observe something happening um, in the world and you come up with a hypothesis 
hypothesis or a best guess for why that thing is happening. A theory is no different from that, um, only here we're studying families and we're studying human beings. And so um, our look on, uh, on human beings and studying them obviously is very different from how a scientist would study a plant or something um, much more uh, predictable. <laughs> and you'll find that throughout these chapters and as we're learning more about communication and families, that it is sometimes oh, much more difficult to predict human behavior um, because human behavior isn't as consistent as studying a plant or studying um, gravity, right, which has consistent principles that apply to it. Um, and so what are some ways that we use theory um, in order to help us explain, understand, or predict um, how human beings interact with one another and how they influence one another? Well, one of the first things we do is we um, create uh, models. Uh, models are visual um, representations, examples of related phenomena, meaning that um, we usually put up a model or a chart to help us understand how one aspect of communication um, is influenced by or connected to another. And if this sounds familiar, this actually was something that we covered in chapter one when we looked at the different types of family configurations and when we looked at the different types of um, uh, of uh, uh, couples as well, right? Um, that would fall under the realm of typology. So when we're looking at different categories and types of families um, and, and their configurations, that's an example of a typology. And so before you even knew it, you were already studying models and typologies and theory essentially in chapter one. Um, and now you're just kind of getting um, a much more in-depth look at it. So, um, Theories are kind of like what I like to call the tools for studying family communication. They are our lens, our way of looking at families as they relate to communication. And they truly help us figure out why is this family behaving this way? Or why is this family um, in such a healthy state and this family is not, right? It really helps us understand a lot of the, the dynamics that are going on in families. And as you, um, many of you uh, may have written in your discussion boards, um, you ask questions, right? Um, you've asked, oh, how does um, having social media technology affect children developing now? Or um, how does a parent spanking their children affect the child's outcome? When you ask these types of questions, what you're really doing is you're trying to grasp at a theory for why or when or how that happens. Um, and so you all have it in you to create and think of theories and use them to help you understand more about family communication and their dynamics. And so, um, and that really sums up this slide right here. You know, researchers, Use theory to study families. Theories help make sense of family life. And lastly, theories offer a way to make sense of raw data to help researchers know what should be considered and what should be ignored. Um, and when I say theories are our lens, that's really what we're thinking of. So imagine you're wearing a pair of sunglasses and those sunglasses are tinted yellow. So the moment you put them on, everything you see around in your world will have like a little bit of a yellow tint to it. That's probably not its true color, but that's what it'll look like to you. And that's really what theory does for researchers. It helps us pay attention to the things that we should pay attention to, but it also alters the rest of our perception. And so that's why you'll find that in this chapter and in this whole book, there's a wide variety of family theories to look at. Because as I said before, human behavior, while sometimes it is predictable, other times it is not. So that's why we have this wide array of tools to help us focus on different things in different contexts. Sometimes if I'm looking at a child from a developmental linear straight on theory, as I'll talk about later, I might miss out on a lot of the other less linear, less straightforward aspects of their development and what they're going through. And I'll talk about this and I'll reference this final um, paragraph later on when I talk about um, different types of theories that are covered here. And so let's look at, as I said, um, the first thing we learned was what theory is and what it does. Why is it useful to us? And now we're moving on to the second big thing in this chapter that I want you to know, which are um, the intellectual traditions. That's what it's called in the textbook. But really how I want you to think about it is ways of approaching studying families and communication, right? Ways of thinking. And so there are three major ones that are covered in this chapter, the post-positivistic, the interpretivist, and the um, critical approach. So let's go through those. So post-positivistic approach, 
I know it's a lot of syllables, lots of eyes in that word. Um, this assumes that there's this objective reality that we can study. Um, so if we could make a, a, a scientist out of you in studying family communication, um, you would be a post-positivistic uh, person. You would be someone that would really like to do surveys and data um, and really collect data on families and try to come up with conclusions um, based off that data, based off your family's answers. So one example might be um, uh, 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 of a post-positivistic approach or study might be, um, let's say I want to know how technology impacts family communication. So I might, if I'm from a post-positivistic approach, hand out a bunch of surveys to all the families living in Southern California. And I ask them questions like, do you use technology in at home? Um, what types of technology do you use? Is it a cell phone, an iPad, or a computer? I might ask them how often their children are allowed to use technology. And then I might ask them questions like, rate your communication satisfaction from 1 to 10. And then I collect all that data and I might find some correlation in that data. I might look at that data and find that parents who allow their children to use lots of social media, um, maybe use their iPad two or three hours a day, report less satisfaction with their communication. And using that data, I might actually be able to come up with the theory for why that happens. Um, and so the post-positivist top positivistic approach really means that you are approaching family communication and human communication from this standpoint that there is this objective reality out there that human beings create um, and that because human beings create them you have to survey those human beings and collect data on them um, and from that you then uh, draw conclusions from that experiment or that study um, and typically what we're trying to do here is um, predict through probability so um, while, like I said before, human behavior, um, you can't say 100% something will happen because humans are very unpredictable. Um, one of the things that post-positivistic uh, 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 researchers want to do is that they want to be able to, with the highest probability possible, predict someone's behavior, right? Predict what will happen. So for example, um, there are studies out there that show us that um, children who experience bullying in um, school are more likely to be withdrawn and quiet in their communication at home. And so that comes from a post-positivistic approach. That means that researchers went out there, collected data on children who were being bullied, and collected data on how they behaved around their families, and tried to draw these connections between these two phenomena. And I hope now that we're seeing more of these examples that you understand more of my previous slides about theory, about how it connects um, two phenomena together, and tries to explain how they are related. All right. Um, but of course, as it says here, um, even though there is this uh, a, a assumption of an objective reality, um, it's still imperfectly known. So that's why post positivistic researchers, while they do try to study um, uh, external reality as much as possible, they are they do recognize that they can never say with 100 percent certainty that they are able to predict human behavior. Right. Um, is it always that um, uh, children who are bullied, do they always withdraw and get quiet at home? No, maybe some of them actually speak up more at home and um, are more social at home because they're happy to be at home and um, not at the location where they're being bullied. It's quite possible. And so um, that's one drawback of the post-positivistic approach is that um, uh, we can't say uh, even with any data or any research that we do that we can 100% predict um, human behavior. But the awesome thing is, is that most of the time we can get to um, uh, at least over 50%, if not a decently high probability amount um, of predicting uh, behavior. So moving on from that, now we're going to go a totally left field, completely different from the post-positivistic approach to the interpretive approach. And this views truths as subjective and co-created by the participants. So if you are a researcher that um, studies families from the interpretive approach, what you might do is go to visit a family 
and ask them to tell you stories, ask them their opinions about their family, ask them about their experiences, and you would write all that down, and all of your data or all the, the materials you collect from your study won't be numbers like it would be a post-positivistic researcher, but rather you are collecting narratives, stories, and experiences, subjective experiences from the family that you are studying. And the reason for why this is, is because if you are someone who is comes from an interpretive approach, you believe that every single human being creates their own reality. Um, they live in their own reality and their own perspective. And so the interpretivist doesn't think that studying people using data can help because they believe I would rather just go in there and live the life of these families and understand more about these families and what they're going through. Um, and so instead of, like I said, collecting numbers, surveys, and trying to predict human behavior, um, they're trying to just understand human behavior by collecting um, people's narratives and stories and reasons for why they're doing things. Um, and even though these two approaches, these first two approaches seem very contradictory, they can be very helpful to one another. So a post-positivistic person might come up with a research that says, oh, we uh, we find that um, X percent, uh, these 50 percent of families um, that own two cars go on more vacations and tend to be more happy. Um, and an interpretivist might be like, really? And they'll go in and they'll research it, uh, by studying those families, talking to them one on one and say, hey, do you guys you know, have more fun on your vacations? Do you ha have more vacations? Do you think you um, are happier than the average family? And they'll ask these questions and just let people answer openly whatever their answer is. Um, and so the interpretivist can help the post-positivistic scientist by saying, hey, um, I see what your data is pointing to. Let me go in and actually study these families and see if that's actually true. Um, so the interpretive approach, even though it seems to contradict the post-positivistic approach, really helps validate it and verify um, the data that is collected by the post-positivistic scientist. So lastly, we have the critical approach. Um, and this uh, approach is, again, very wildly different from the first two. Um, and this posits that theories exist to bring values to the surface where they can be challenged or changed. And really what that means is that the critic is not someone that is interested in collecting data, like the post-positivistic person. They're not interested in um, going in and collecting interviews like the interpretivist um, um, would be, they are more interested in seeing how values compete with one another in a family and how power um, falls into uh, uh, these conversations um, and how power is used within families um, to promote certain values and um, not promote other values. Um, and so really what the critic is interested in is not what is really happening, but how people are really feeling. And so they kind of take a different perspective on on reality altogether, um, because what they believe is that families are here to make meaning with one another um, and to promote different um, uh, uh, values and power systems with one another. So regardless of whether or not a parent thinks they have authority, the critic would want to study, well, whether or not they really do by observing whether or not their, their child actually listens to them. Um, and so one of the awesome things about that is that when you look at these three approaches, even though they seem um, very contradictory, they help. Um, and the critic is awesome because the critic really helps us um, take into account all the different aspects of identity that can play out um, in any given context. Um, so for example, in your textbook, there's a fantastic example about black women's experiences written by Patricia Hill Collins in 1990. And she talks about this idea um, uh, about black women's experiences um, and how their type of political activism is very unique and different um, from women who are not black. Um, and so the critical approach really helps us understand how those with privilege or those who do not have privilege both inside a family and outside a family um, can exert their power or have power exerted upon them um, and what kind of choices people are left over with that after those values and those powers are exerted. Um, so they might ask, for example, um, 
how are these relationships between those with power and those without um, constructed, right? How are they constructed with communication? And I'm using the word constructed on purpose because constructed means that we're creating, right, um, these relationships. We're imbuing a perspective on these relationships. So the critic really thinks that it's important to recognize not just what is happening, but how people feel about it. Um, one example I want to give you um, is that um, I'm sure uh, many of you have heard about um, the, uh, the 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 social issues um, that have been coming up um, with Colin Kaepernick, um, the football player, um, kneeling during the national anthem. And one of the interesting things that a student actually gave me a wonderful example of this that I'd like to share with you. Um, of course, you may have heard that the two prevailing thought processes about Colin Kaepernick kneeling during the uh, national anthem is those on uh, those on one side might think, well, he's being very disrespectful to the flag and this is not the appropriate time or context to protest. Um, those on another side might think well he's just exercising his you know first amendment rights free speech and so of course he's it, it's totally appropriate for him to um uh, be uh, uh silently protesting during the national anthem and a student told me that she was communicating about this with her family um and we've talked about this in chapter one about how there's external culture right things going on around the world that um still influence our families our families are not cut off right as bubbles from the rest of the world and so so she talked about the social issue with her family. And she is definitely uh, someone who believes that um, uh, he... The, that he has, uh, Colin Kaepernick has this First Amendment right to protest peacefully. However, um, her brother and her father are, um, uh, well, her father is a veteran and her brother um, is currently actively serving in the military. And her brother and her father are vehemently against Colin Kaepernick's choice of protest. And when he, you know, when he kneels during the national anthem, they see that as being very disrespectful to America. So she talked to me about how she felt that she did not have um, the ability to voice her concerns and voice her opinions despite the fact that she very much believed in them because she did not want to come off as disrespecting her brother or her father so that's a great example of how in reality just because she's voicing her opinion that doesn't mean she's trying to um disrespect her father or disrespect her brother but she recognizes that that is what might that that is what they might interpret it as or feel that she's doing. And so the critic really helps us understand this difference between what is happening in reality and actually how people feel. So in reality, if she voices her opinion, she's just voicing her opinion. She's not doing it to disrespect her brother or father, but she knows that it's quite possible they may feel disrespected. And the feeling there, um, that, that power dynamic and that privilege dynamic um, is really what the critic is interested in studying. And I know I think out of all the three approaches, this is probably um, one of the more abstract to understand. Um, but I hope that that example kind of helps you flesh out some of the things that a critic might look at when they're trying to observe families communicating. All right. Um, so as we're looking through um, uh, the different theories that are offered to us in this chapter. One of the things we want to do before we dive into any theory is understand the assumptions that um, we are taking on when we are studying these theories. Um, so the first assumption that we're going to assume is that communication is the center of family identity and culture. We talked about this in chapter one, um, that a majority, if not all the theories we study in this book are going to be about communication in the family specifically, not even family relations in a, any other way. Um, because we recognize that communication is the major way that families can continue to thrive and exist with one another. The second assumption is that um, family life changes with the passage of time. So we have to recognize that um, any of our theories, um, when applied to different stages of a family's life, might yield different results. Um, Influences of social and cultural context, like I mentioned previously with my Colin Kaepernick example, we can't assume that um, that there is never going to be an outside force that will impact our families. It's quite, it's always relevant. Um, what's happening in the world and what's happening in our country and our community is always relevant to our families because it'll inevitably infect, affect our families either directly um, by affecting us, the family economically or affecting them culturally. Um, 
uh, uh, through the way they relate to one another and the way they see each other. And the last one is that we assume that the family is a meaning-making system, meaning that um, family members create um, and maintain relationships with one another that are incredibly unique um, to each other and to themselves, um, and that this creates ultimately a family culture um, that is shared amongst all the members. So the first theory that we are going to uh, look at um, is quite uh, 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 straightforward. I think it's probably one of the most useful theories um, to start out with uh, because it covers such a wide range of possibilities and can really help us understand and answer a lot of questions about how families work with one another or sometimes don't work with one another, right? So systems theories, uh, as you can see here, it has um, a variety of pieces and I've kind of distilled them here um, in my slide, but I kind of want to point out where you can find this information um, in your textbook. It is on page uh, 67 so you can see um, this beautiful little chart that is provided to you um, I'm a really visual person so I love that chart as well um, so my slides here try to reference that chart as much as possible but really what systems theory um, helps us to do is that it helps us put on our little post positivistic hats and analyze our family um, uh, uh, by assuming two things. We assume that all families share certain characteristics. So um, system theory assumes that no matter what, where you come from, what your culture is, where in the world you live, your family will share the similar characteristics as everybody else's family. Um, it also focuses on looking at patterns of family behavior, which is incredibly useful for us. Um, a lot of us, uh, when we're dealing with difficulties in our relationships, we tend to identify the last fight that we had with someone or the last disagreement we had with someone as the root cause for what's going on. But really what systems theory will remind us and will continue reminding us is that families are exist as patterns, right? Patterns of reoccurring behavior. One example of this is divorce, right? Um, spouses very rarely just decide to divorce overnight, right? That very, very rarely happens. Um, usually divorce occurs at the end of uh, maybe months or years of recurring communication patterns that left either one or both people in the marriage dissatisfied. Um, so rarely what we is it just an overnight thing. What we see perceptually is you know, the big fight right before the divorce and even the fighting during the divorce process, right? But what we forget sometimes is that there was a whole history and a whole host of um, communication patterns that led up to that moment, right? Um, couples very rarely break up just because. It's usually because of months or years um, of interactions that they've had that have left them dissatisfied with one another. Um, <clears throat> And lastly, um, before I move into the different pieces of systems theory, the last assumption um, I want you to remember is that um, systems theory seeks to provide um, explanations for family behaviors. It helps us by looking at all these different pieces, as you can see here my mouse um, scrolling over it, all these different pieces, if we look at them and we analyze each family's component or their pieces, it helps us to understand um, why families behave the way they do. Why is this family this way? Why is this family dysfunctional? Why is this family functional, right? Um, so let me go ahead and go through all these different pieces of the systems theory. Um, I love thinking of systems theory as like a little factory, right? Like every um, piece in that factory has a job, right? Um, in order for the factory to produce what it needs to produce. And so think of systems theory as that lens or that way of looking at a family, right? It makes us look at a family like a little factory where each person and each piece kind of has to be working for production to be working. Um, so the first piece is that wholeness. Um, this means is that the system, uh, the sum of the, the parts are bigger than the whole. Um, what that refers to is that we can't treat um, each family member as separate from one another. Um, the family is not just a, a, a sum of all the members added up. The family unit as a whole has its own personality, has its own life to it, has its own culture. And so we have to treat this family with as wholeness, right? We can't just look at one family member or the other. We have to recognize um, that the whole family has its own personality, its own life that is different from 
the combination of each of its members. Um, one example I might give you is if you look at um, a band, right? Um, if you look at a band, there's usually a head singer, a guitarist, a drummer, right? Um, and all of them, if you look at them separately, it doesn't really quite make sense because when they are separate, they're not quite as powerful or as um, awesome as they are together, right? And so this the, the whole is much greater than the sum of all the parts. Um, and that's really how we should be looking at families. We shouldn't be looking at one family member in isolation. And what that helps us understand is usually if we have a dysfunctional family, very rarely is it just that one person um, that's causing a problem. There might be one really toxic person in the family, but we have to look at the family as a whole and see is anyone enabling that toxic behavior? Is anyone hurt by that toxic behavior? Who are the victims of this toxic behavior? Who are the bystanders? Who might be encouraging it? Um, we kind of have to look at the family as a whole, despite the fact that there might be one you know, person that might be the most obvious instigator of toxic behavior. We really have to look at the family as a whole. The second one is interdependence. Um, we've covered this a little bit in chapter one, but really what that refers to is this idea that families um, need one another. Family members um, uh, are interrelated, not only biologically, but they need one another to survive and live, and that their behaviors, therefore, are interconnected, right? Um, especially since when we grow up in our families, they influence each other a lot. Um, all of us have our own unique personalities, but all of us are also products of our parents or our guardians. Whoever raised us, um, we definitely took on some of their personalities or didn't take on some of their personalities, um, but they influenced us very heavily. And so we have to remember that that um, the system is interconnected, meaning that um, all members within the family need one another, depend on one another, and are influenced by one another. The third one is hierarchy. Um, most all families have hierarchy. They have um, levels of which people have power and people who do not, of course. Um, boundaries and openness refers to um, how open the family is to change um, from the outside world and how closed off they are and the subsystems they contain. What this means is... Um, um, for example, um, how willing the family is to allow outside forces to influence them and how willing the family is allowed, uh, how willing the family is to allow subsystems to influence them. So, for example, um, Think of your immediate family, right? So if we're thinking nuclear family uh, configuration, that might be um, a child with their mom and their dad, um, nuclear family, right? Um, to what extent does the this immediate family allow their extended family, that particular subsystem, influence their behavior? So for example, would your mom go to her uncle for advice? Would your mom go to her sister for advice on something and bring that advice into the family, right? Um, that's an example of a boundary, right? Some families are very closed off where they don't really like other people outside of the immediate family being involved in their decision making, giving them advice, or in, in interacting with them um, deeply on that level and some families are very open where they want their extended families to be part of their lives intimately they want other people outside of the family to be part of their lives intimately right um, one example might be um, who's in invited to thanksgiving so if you all have thanksgiving dinner together and it's usually only immediate family then you might have a little bit more closed boundaries but if you're allowed to for example invite your friends from school to go have thanksgiving dinner with your family you might have have more open boundaries okay um second to last one calibration feedback so um everything that any family member does um they'll always be met with feedback um and calibration meaning uh, editing um this is the best example of this is being punished by your parents right so you might behave a certain way as a child your parents are like nope we don't like that and so they might calibrate you by providing you with some form of negative feedback to let you know hey don't do that anymore um and it helps stabilize and set norms for the relationship and for the family as a whole. Um, and lastly, equifinality. Um, this refers to the idea how families can reach the same goal, but in many different ways, right? Um, and what this reminds us is that every family um, has their own way of doing things. And so if we look at, if we try to compare contrast families, that might not always work because what works for one family might not work for the other. And so what we're doing with Equifin finality is that we're recognizing that there's multiple paths to the same journey there's multiple paths to the same um, uh, destination, right? That there's this idea that 
um, a single family can do, uh, uh, can achieve a goal by engaging in multiple activities, and another family might achieve the same goal by just doing one activity. Um, and it also reminds us as well um, that different families can achieve the same goal with multiple pathways, right? Um, so families um, that say, that if you ask any given family, are you happy as a family? What's your level of happiness? Every family might define their own happiness in different ways and get to the goal of happiness in different ways, right? So for one family, happiness might mean just being able to hang out and be together. For another family, happiness might mean not arguing in a day, right? They might have different pathways to get to that goal of happiness. Um, so system theory is awesome because if we use it to um, analyze uh, families, it kind of helps us understand what part of this factory is not working, right? What piece of this uh, machine is not functioning properly? But there are limitations as there are to any theory. And so um, a lot of students will ask me, which theory is the best one to study families? And I will tell you, it kind of depends on the context, kind of depends on what perspective you want to take as a person, what you're interested in. Um, because every theory has its its drawbacks, right? No theory is absolutely 100% perfect. Um, and that's because, as I said earlier, um, it's very difficult to always predict human behavior um, and, and touch on every single aspect of um, human variability, right? So with any theory that I cover for you today, I'll not only be covering the benefits of it, but I'll also be covering the limits of it or what it can't do. Um, and one of the biggest problems with systems approach is that it um, assumes that um, families just want homeostasis. They just want to be, you know, normal and happy and thriving all the time. Um, and that's not really what family life is like, right? Um, Families don't always strive for just stability all the time and um, basic survival needs. Families are so much more of that, right? Um, and what that reminds us is that um, uh, 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 that families will experience change within the family, externally as well. Um, and so the systems approach kind of assumes that things will always be the same um, and that families always want things to stay the same. And that might not be true, right? Families might want to change their own configurations or change themselves. Um, and of course, that really, like I said before, um, remember when I said that theory sometimes is like a lens, right? Like sunglasses that'll let you see certain things but block you off from other things. Um, one of the things that systems theory blocks us off from or makes it really hard for us to understand um, is how unpredictable families are, right? So when there's a blip on the screen, when there is this unpredictable random behavior that comes from families, Systems theory can't really explain that. It really can't step in and say, well, I don't know why this person did this very unpredictable, random thing, um, because it assumes that all families want to be static and the same. Um, and so it doesn't really help us understand at an individual level, what each family member does. Um, even looking back at the last slide, one of the first pieces of systems approach is wholeness. Systems uh, a theory tells us that we can't, we have to look at the family as a whole. And that's great. And that really helps us understand families as a whole and how in how different members of the family impact one another. But one of the things it blocks us from understanding is how each individual has their own personality and makes their own choices independent of their families, which we all do, right? We've all made choices independent of our families, at least at one point in time, if not many times. Um, and so systems theory doesn't help us explain why that happens um, and how that really impacts the family either. Um, and it also um, doesn't really take into account diversity, right? Um, like I said before, systems approach is this factory, you know, looking at a family like a factory, all the different pieces working together. Um, but this focus on the micro functioning in families implies that cultural differences don't impact family communication. This doesn't help us understand, for example, blended families where um, you might have individuals from different racial categories living as a family together. Um, it doesn't help us understand 
how different cultural values might play into a family and compete with one another because the systems approach because it's post positivistic as I said earlier um, it assumes that there's this external reality this universal truth and that all families are pretty much um, static and the same and we can just study them the same way um, and so it doesn't really take into account different cultural variables that might come in um, with studying different types of families. So with that being said, let us um, move on to social construction theory. Um, and this theory um, is not as um, blocky and build uh, like Lego <laughs> looking like systems theory is. Um, and really what social construction theory is, I love the title because it pretty much tells you exactly what its focus is based off its title. But Social construction theory assumes that families work together to create meaning. They socially construct meaning with one another. And this is an interpretivist um, uh, theory. So we just studied a post-positivistic. Now we're studying a very popular interpretive tradition. Um, and so this um, kind of doesn't look at families like a factory, like I said before, with systems approach. Social construction theory looks at a family like a stage full of actors, right? And they're acting and they're creating meaning together um, continuously through their communication interactions. And so one of the ways that um, an interpretivist might study this is they might look at how storytelling plays into a family. Think, for example, of a story that your parents told you or your grandparents told you, an elder in your family told you when you were young. Um, one example might be uh, we find that children who are the children of immigrants are usually told the story of how their parents or their grandparents first immigrated to the United States. And social construction theory tells us that when a grandfather tells that immigration story to his grandchild, what he's really passing on in that interaction is a sense of meaning, right? A sense of relationship. He's really telling that child that... Um, uh, expressing all that he has sacrificed for that child's life. He's encouraging that child um, to do what they, they can with their life um, because of his uh, sacrifices to bring the child um, to the to the United States. And that's a very common um, story, right? Um, uh, I myself, um, a, as an immigrant, um, definitely heard my, my family's immigration story. And as a child, I really imbued a lot of meaning from that. And it impacted not only my family identity, but my personal identity as well. It made me really passionate about pursuing my education. Um, and it really um, made me passionate about um, pursuing a career that I loved because I knew that the life that I have now is because of the sacrifices of previous family members before me. Um, and so uh, it's an awesome way of just looking at how narrative, stories, communication, um, construct relationships and meaning symbolically between family members. And so it's much more gray and mixed up than systems theory is. Systems theory is very straight to the point, cold cut, right? Um, social construction theory really looks at how families make meaning and share meaning with one another and create this identity and culture with one another, right? Create this family identity with one another. And like I said before, every theory has limits. So what are the limits of social construction theory? Well, um, it's very abstract uh, because it's based on narratives, storytelling, communication, interactions, symbolism. Um, it's more for description than it is to explain. Whereas systems theory might try to explain why a family behaves a certain way, social construction theory just describes a family, describes what their culture is like, describes what their um, relationships are like. It doesn't really explain why, right? Um, so it more helps us understand the when and the how, but it doesn't really answer the why for us. Um, and so it's a very difficult methodology to apply. And the last, uh, one of the last ones that we'll cover is a dialectics. And so um, when you're looking at dialectics, please don't look at them as good or bad, right or wrong ideals. It's really about um, opposing viewpoints that are have tension with one another. Um, as you can see here by my slide, it's, it's about um, how families negotiate or try to understand um, where they fit in this continuum of tensions. And if you haven't guessed it yet, this is the critical approach um, um, this is a, this is a theory that comes from the critical approach um, because it focuses totally on um, these tensions, these power poles, and these values that come along um, with it. So 
let me just get right to the example so you can get what I'm saying. Um, dialectical tensions are central to family life. And what dialectical tensions refers to is that in every family life, in every relationship you have, in with every member of your family, there will be tensions that you have to deal with. Um, one of the ones you might have to deal with is autonomy and connection. Autonomy refers to a desire for independence, whereas connection refers to a desire to be connected and enmeshed with your family. And this might be a tension that you had to negotiate or figure out with your family when you became teenagers, right? As a child, a young child, you were probably very, very tightly connected to your parents because you needed them more, right, as a young child. But maybe as you grew up um, into, as into, um, uh, a teenager, um, as we see with most teenagers, teenagers desire more autonomy. They desire more independence. And so there will be this tension, this pulling back and forth between your parents who want you to stay connected to them and you wanting more autonomy, wanting more independence, right? So that's one example of this tension, this pulling back and forth that you might have between you and your, your parents until you and your parents negotiate that one sweet spot, right? Where maybe you can go out every other night um, and that's okay, or maybe you can only go out on weekends, right? Um, but it has to be negotiated. It has to be talked about um, because that tension can't just continue, right? And another example, uh, the second one is openness versus protection. So this refers to the idea of how um, how open or how free you are to behave um, in your uh, your family um, and how much um, you want to be protective of your family. So one example might be. <clears throat> If you are someone that wants to reveal a lot of personal, private information about yourself to your family, you might be more open, right? You might be someone that wants to be more open with your family. Um, however, if you're someone that really kind of likes to keep your personal private stuff to yourself and not share it with your family, you might be more on the protection side. And so you might experience tension in your family because maybe your parents or your siblings or your family members want to know about your new uh, uh, romantic partner. They might want to know, oh, who are you dating or how's it going? And you might not want to tell them yet, right? You might not be comfortable with revealing that information yet. So there will be that tension, that push and pull where you will have to negotiate with your family members the extent to which you're open and the extent to which you're protected. The third one is novelty and predictability, and this refers to um, how uh, how predictable, how consistent your family behavior and activities are, and how novel or new or surprising they are. Um, and so this refers to um, our desire for stability and the excitement of change. All of us in every relationship want stability, right? Um, you want a family that's pretty stable, that it's pretty predictable, right? Um, where some there, there, there isn't um, too much change going on every day and how people feel about you or how you feel about them. But you also want a family that does fun and different things. And so, for example, if you go on the same, if you go to Hawaii every year as your family vacation, you might feel like that's too predictable for you, right? Um, and so you might want to opt for novelty where you offer, hey, why don't we just go somewhere else or try a different family vacation or try something different this year. Um, if you would ask that question of your family, you're probably more on the novelty side. And families have to negotiate this, how much are we staying stable and how much do we change and do different things. Um, and it's important, right? Because you don't want to be too predictable because relationships get stale and boring um, and and not uh, uh, and too comfortable. But if you are not predictable and you're very novel, you're always changing and surprising one another, then you lose the comfort of predictability, right? Um, so it's, a, again, another tension that has to be negotiated. And every family will negotiate these tensions in different ways. There's no right or wrong answer. Dialectics does not prescribe a perfect way um, to to uh, negotiate these tensions. Um, dialectics just tells us that it has to be negotiated, that your family cannot ignore that these tensions exist, okay? So how do you manage these tensions? Well, dialectical theory tells us a couple things. It tells us that you can do cyclic alteration. So many syllables in this, <laughs> this chapter. Um, and this is when families choose one of the different opposites, right? So they either choose autonomy, connection, openness, protection, novelty, predictability. Here's one example. 
So let's say as a teenager, you're struggling. You're struggling for that um, autonomy and your parents really want that connection. So one of the ways that you might manage this tension with your parents is through cyclic alteration where you say, okay, when it comes to my school stuff, I really want you connected. I really want you always there at my games. I really want you always helping me with school and always at all my school events. But I don't want you doing it at these times of the year, right? Um, I want more autonomy at these times of the year. Um, So you're telling them a time when you want autonomy and when you want connection and usually you split between one or the other. You cyclically alternate, right? So um, we're gonna be more connected now and then a month later I would like some more independence okay Um, and so and this usually is because of change Um, this might be impacted by the birth of a child this might be impacted by moving or getting a new job so you might say hey right now I need a little bit more predictability because I just moved I just got a new job, right? A lot of stuff's going on in my life right now. So I don't want to do anything crazy. I just want to have dinner normally. I don't want to go out or do anything new. Um, but, you know, we might alternate the next month and do something new and crazy after that. That's alternation. Segmentation is when you chop it up into different pieces of your life. One example of this is that um, in uh, my personal life, I like to have um, a lot of autonomy um, when it comes to uh, my, uh, my work. So, um, I don't really like a lot of, um, asking a lot of, for a lot of help from my family members when it comes to my work. Um, I really want to, um, think of ideas and think of uh, strategies for teaching, um, or, um, projects or presentations or research on my own. And I don't want any input from my family or friends. I'm very autonomous and independent. Um, but in other aspects of my life that are not work, I want connections. So, um, when I want suggestions for where I should go eat or where I should go on vacation or what I should, um, do for the weekend, um, I usually go to my family for that. So, um, I segment my life up where I say, um, when it comes to work, I kind of want my own space, but everywhere else I'm good. Okay. That's different from cyclic alternation because um, this usually has to do with time. This usually means one month I'm this, one month I'm that. Segmentation doesn't depend on time, it depends on topic. So for me, my topic is work. I need more autonomy for myself at work, um, but otherwise I love connection in other all parts of my life. Selection is um, when you choose one or the other. (laughs) Um, And uh, usually that involves one person having to kind of give up their stake in that tension, their stake in that negotiation. Um, And integration, uh, this refers to um, trying to take both of these different tensions and putting them together. And that can happen in three ways. It can happen with neutralization, reframing, and disqualifying. Neutralizing means that you come to a compromise um, where you both try to find a happy medium, like a little happy average between the two. Reframing is when you reframe the tension so it doesn't seem to appear anymore. Um, So for example, when it comes to openness and protection, some family members might want to be able to access your phone and you might not be willing to let them access your phone, right? Um, And so one way to reduce this tension or negotiate this tension might be to reframe it by saying, hey, it's not that I want to see your phone because I don't trust you. It's that I want to be able to get the passcode to your phone because I want to know that you can trust me, right? So I'm reframing the situation and making it not that uh, I, I, I'm trying to get into your phone because I don't trust you as a spouse. I just want to, the passcode to your phone because I want to feel like you trust me with the passcode, right? Um, that's a reframing. That's when you're trying to get rid of the contradiction altogether, right? Um, and disqualifying um, is when you try to exempt or get uh, or or exclude certain issues um, from the pattern. So um, you might just say like, "Hey, there are certain things that um, I don't really want to ha- have a discussion about." Um, so two couples, uh, a couple might say, "Hey, um, when it comes to." Um, uh, openness and protection one of the things that I definitely want you to always um, be open with me about um, is finances but uh, I kind of 
think we're going to disqualify or exempt the topic of sex from, you know, our everyday conversations. And so if both people agree or the whole family agrees, like, we're just not going to talk about this, right? This is going to be disqualified. This is not a topic. It helps the tension better. Because sometimes when it comes to dealing with these tensions, sometimes it's just a certain aspect of family life or a topic that makes people uncomfortable. And so if you just disqualify or exempt it or exclude it from everyday conversation, um, it can help renegotiate that tension. So the last theory we'll look at today is developmental theory, um, very accurately titled so, um, and it looks at how families change over time. So um, if you are a child development major, uh, this is definitely familiar to you. So this would refer to these ideas of how um, families grow right throughout time. Um, and uh, how it analyzes how different um, conditions have to be met for a family to progress into different stages. Um, and it sees, therefore, family development as a linear process, a stage process, where you go through stage one, two, three, four, five. Um, it's not cyclical, um, and it doesn't really allow for um, anything outside of this kind of construction. So let me kind of go further into this. <clears throat> Again, I'm really visual, so I want to call your attention to page 81 in the textbook. And so page 81 really helps us understand, ooh, this light's bad. Um, there you go. Um, helps us understand a little bit more about how linear it is. So you can kind of see that there's a start and a beginning to developmental theory, right? Um, whereas uh, in other, uh, the previous series that we've been studying, there is no linear structure, right? There's not a start and a beginning. There's just pieces, right, that we might see different relationships with. Um, <clears throat> And so as you can see here, um, it, it helps us uh, um, look at how families grow over time which is really cool. Uh, uh, I think a lot of, it's really fun to kind of even put our own families through developmental theory and kind of see how our, develop, our families have developed over time. Um, one of the key, issue, uh, key things about developmental theory that you need to know, it assumes that the previous stages will always influence the future ones. So how successfully we completed one of these stages will always impact the success of the next ones. Um, over time, as we move through these stages, we'll get consistent patterns of communication that are pretty predictable from families, um, and norms will be integrated, either created by the family or um, from social, external social uh, uh, um, influences, right? Um, social institutions like schools, will heavily influence family and family development over time. Um, and so what we're really looking at here is how um, events really push families into the stage. So um, even in the model that is given to you, right? So there's this idea of cohabitation and then a wedding, then a birth of a child, birth of a second child, divorce, remarriage, first child leaving the home. So it really kind of um, puts families into these little boxes and stages to help us understand how events in a family trigger movement um, in the in the timeline um, and so now that we've kind of looked at um, these different theories um, I want you to go over real quick lastly um, methods of inquiry so the way that these theories would be applied so remember at the very beginning of this lecture I said that theories can be both tested and applied so um, we can test the theories to make sure that they're viable or have a high probability of being accurate and all of the theories that we have studied today have a very high probability of being accurate because they're very well renowned theories that have been tested over and over and over again by scholarly researchers um, who study um, family communication um, and so the way we might apply them and the way we might attest we might test them our methods of inquiry, right? Um, and so the first way we might test or apply theory is quantitative research methods. So this is gathering data, da gathering surveys, um, very post-positivistic. Qualitative is when we gather things like narrative stories, written things that are not um, necessarily dealing with numbers. Um, and these uh, are here to help us try to understand and make sense of experiences. Um, this is more interpretivist uh, approach. Triangulation, is when um, you 
have a question so like I said a lot of you in your discussion forums have asked the who why or when question so you might approach that question using various different methods to see what comes out of it um, remember that whenever we approach a question from a different perspective um, we'll, we might yield different things because a theory will either enlighten us to one aspect and then block us off from another um, and survey research is when um, we give a standardized questionnaire that questionnaire um, usually is written um, by researchers that already have observations so the questions that they write are based off of um, their previous observations so they might ask a question like um, on a scale of 1 to 10 how likely are you to um, uh, uh, confront your spouse if you're unhappy with them right so a question like that has to come from a pre-existing observation about conflict with its spouses um, and so people would answer and then that kind of helps us understand um, through a standardized way um, how respondents might react to certain ideas or questions <clears throat> all right so that is it for chapter two and so to recap really quickly i know that this was a chunky chapter i tried to show it as a little systems theory stuff going on right here right to kind of show you um what we've learned so in the very first stages here um we learned what theory is we learned its definition and most importantly we learned why it matters to us and it matters to us because theories help us explain understand and predict human behavior in a multitude of different ways then we went in and learned the three different approaches or traditions or ways of looking at research so we learned the post positivistic the interpretivist and the critical approach um, and from those we understand the following theories that we learned we learned about systems approach which is post positivistic so it looks at families like little factories right with different pieces and moving parts and it analyzes the family's moving parts to understand their behavior we then <clears throat> excuse me, um, looked at um, a different interpretivist theory. Here, let me move in so you can kind of see it. I want to get to it so you can kind of see the layout and the three pieces. Social construction theory. And that's an interpretivist way um, of looking at how families make meaning with one another through the symbolic process of communication. Um, and so if you're a researcher that likes to do this, that means you like to go in um, and interview family members and understand more about um, their perspective and their um, their experiences and their feelings, right? And unlike post-positivistic traditions, unlike systems theory, it doesn't seek to try to predict or explain, but rather it tries to help us understand more about why people why individuals in that family feel a certain way um, experience things in a certain way and co-create culture and relationships with with each other in a different way it seeks to understand not explain or predict <clears throat> And the last thing that um, we looked at, one of the last theories we looked at um, was the dialectical theory. So we talked about this critical look. Um, it's a critical approach of how um, families experience these tensions, right, um, in their, their lives and how they try to deal with these tensions of being connected or autonomous, right, open or private spontaneous um, or predictable um, and so that theory helps us understand how families negotiate these different um, struggles right and I mean I think it's probably one of the best theories to help us understand where conflict comes from right and how conflict can be best negotiated um, and then lastly we talked about um, family developmental theory which looks at families in a linear way um, how events trigger families to move into different stages um, and then lastly we looked at methods of inquiry which are ways we look uh, ways we approach uh, studying um, testing and applying theories so we learned about how we can do it quantitatively qualitatively we can triangulate or um, we can um, do a questionnaire, right? Um, and so hopefully this kind of overview helps clarify a lot of the things that um, you did initially in your reading. Um, and I'm very proud of um, the kind of first tries that a lot of you made um, with chapter two 
And I think that it's so good to start by reading the chapter, just marinating on it a little bit, then hopefully listening to this lecture, getting some more examples, marinating on it some more, and then engaging in our class activities to apply a lot of our understandings of this. Because um, while this textbook is awesome and this information is great and I love it so much, um, my goal for you all is to be able to see how this works in your everyday lives, in your everyday families, and in the actual real world. So this has been chapter two, providing theoretical frameworks, and I will see you guys all later. Bye.